Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us. I'm Wild Ones National Staff Member Sarah Ressing. I joined Wild Ones this past June as the Education and Program Coordinator, and I'm proud to help produce educational content like tonight's webinar. Wild Ones is excited to welcome you to tonight's online program, The Gardener's Guide to Prairie Plants, with authors Neil DeBall and Hilary Cox, and hosted by Doug Tallamy. But before I turn it over to our host and speaker, a few notes. This webinar is being hosted on YouTube Live. We welcome the use of the chat feature during the presentation, so feel free to introduce yourself. If you would like to hide that chat box, please enter full screen mode. Closed captioning is also available and can be turned on in your settings. Finally, the links referenced in tonight's presentation can be found in the description below and will be posted in the chat by staff. For those of you who are new to Wild Ones, we are a membership organization devoted to promoting native plants and sustainable landscaping. We carry out our mission across the nation through educational programs such as the Wild Ones Journal, Native Garden Designs, Seeds for Education, and webinars like tonight. If you are not a Wild Ones member, we hope you will join us and enjoy the camaraderie and support of being part of a local chapter. At the local level, Wild Ones chapters offer programs including garden tours, speakers, conferences, as well as plant sales, exchanges, and seed collections. Local chapters are a great place to network with other nature enthusiasts and meet like-minded individuals to learn more about native plants. Connect with your local Wild Ones chapter and begin making an environmental impact, contribute to education, and build a network focused on the preservation, restoration, and establishment of native plant communities. If there's not a chapter near you, please think about starting a Wild Ones seedling. Start the conversation with Wild Ones and we can help grow a chapter in your area. Our chapter liaisons are in the chat if you have any questions or you can fill out the information on our website. 
And finally, programs like tonight's webinar would not be possible without your generous support. So please consider donating to Wild Ones tonight. Wild Ones inspires and empowers people and communities across the country to transform landscapes into vibrant and vital habitats for birds, bees, butterflies, and other wildlife. Together, we can continue to educate one another on the importance of native plants and make a positive impact on the environment along the way. Now, I'll turn it over to our host for tonight, Doug Talamy. He is a Wild Ones Lifetime Honorary Director, Professor, and Co-Founder of the Homegrown National Park. Doug, I will let you take it from here. Well, thank you, Sarah. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I've been at the uh, University of Delaware for 42 years, so I've been around the block. Um, but it's interesting. Um, I have given lots of webinars, but I've never hosted one. So I don't know why Neil and, and Hillary asked me to host this. Maybe it's because I've known Neil and Hillary for more than 15 years. Maybe it's because we're kindred spirits. Maybe it's because I'm an enthusiastic supporter of, of what they do and the book that they just published, Gardener's Guide to Prairie Plants. In fact, I wrote a, a blurb for the book jacket. Uh, it went something like this. If you're looking for the complete and I do mean complete guide to prairie ecosystems, you will not do better than this much needed book. Neil and Hillary cover not only what prairie species look like at each of their growth stage, which is a first by the way, but they also dive very deeply into their historical and ecological roles in prairie ecosystems. I say it's a much needed book because I'm asked all the time about how to add prairies or meadows to uh, residential landscapes. It's, it's one of our biggest challenges. But Neil and, and Hillary have come to the rescue with this book. Um, so Neil, Neil DeBoll is the president and consulting ecologist for Prairie Nurt Nursery. And he has been for over 40 years. He's a Wild Ones lifetime honorary director and has dedicated his life to the propagation of native plants, promotes their benefits and furthering their use in gardens, landscapes and restoration projects. Hillary Cox is a horticulturist, garden designer, a botanist, and a photographer. She was the owner and landscape designer of Leescape Garden Design for over 20 years, and has previously held positions as a designated collector of prairie and woodland seeds. So now let's hear from, from Neil and Hillary uh, about their wonderful book. Take it away. Thanks, Doug. It's great to see you and great to be on the Wild Ones webinar here and the opportunity to share this book that we spent 22 years on. It's hard to believe. And I bet people are probably wondering, why in the world did we do this book? And what was the motivation? And I um, will blame all of this on Hillary because it was her idea. And it all started around 2000 when she said, Neil, we have to do a book that shows prairie plants when they're coming up in the spring so my clients don't pull them up thinking they're weeds. I said, gee, Hillary, that's a great idea. How many people are going to buy that book? Ten of our closest friends? So, of course, we started off on this. And this was before digital cameras were really very good. And so we were doing everything with slides because if you had really good slide film, it was far better than digital cameras unless you had $50,000, which we didn't have. So then we got about five years into this and then digital cameras became better. So we threw out all the slides and started all over with digital. But we realized that just showing what native plants, prairie plants look like when they're emerging from the soil, you know, that's kind of a, a limited market. So we thought, well, what else would people be interested in in telling plants vegetatively? Well, how about the leaves? So we said, we better get pictures of the leaves because a lot of times you don't have flowers or other distinguishing characteristics. So let's include leaves. Well, if you're gonna do a book on plants, you better show some flowers. So let's add some flowers. Well, you know, another thing that people really like to see is the whole plant, so you can see it in context. Okay, we'll get pictures of all the whole plant. Well, now we're up to four different stages of the plant. And then, hey, you know, what's missing is what the seeds look like. A lot of people don't know what the seeds look like and they wanna know. So let's do the seeds. Okay, we'll add seeds. Oh, hey, look at this. You know, when some seeds are in their immature phase, they look very different from when they're mature. So for many species, we had to do early or immature seeds and then late or mature seeds. And then finally, of course, what is a big question that people ask all the time is, hey, what do the seedlings look like? Well, before we knew it, we had seven different phases seedling. We have a mature plant emerging from the soil, the leaf, the flower, the entire plant, and early and mature seeds. And of course, for grasses, how do you tell a grass when it's not in bloom or with seeds? You have to look at the vegetative characteristics and one of the more diagnostic characteristics is the ligule which is the point where the leaf 
blade meets the stem or sheath of the of the grass. And so you have to get a close-up picture, most of which I took in the evening hours with a tripod. Almost all the pictures were taken with a tripod, and and this is before cameras were very good. And so with a a, a release, so you didn't actually touch the camera, so it didn't shake. And a lot of these were 30 second exposures so you could get the depth of field. So if you had 28 seconds and a puff of wind came along, too bad, start over. At any rate, this was a long extended process. Then when we submitted the book to the publisher, they said, well, you know, this is all well and good, but aren't you gonna do something about how to, to um, garden and restore and do meadows and all this? Oh, that's a whole nother book. Yeah, but you need that. Okay, so we had to write a whole nother book and add it to the fixtures. So that's why it took forever and ever and ever. And we did have lives on the side, like running businesses. So there were high high ATI where we did not work on the book because we were busy, you know, doing other things, as John Lennon would say. So finally, after 22 years, we finally got this thing done. And of course, never, nothing is ever done, but it's as close as we could get it. So there's your kind of thumbnail sketch of how this book came to be. And our goal really was to create a timeless reference that will never go out of date until the plants start evolving so that they're no longer the same as they are in the book, but we'll be gone by then. So that's kind of the story of where this book came from. And I'm sure Hillary can add some details to that as well. Well, um, yeah, I think I can. This is where I am working as a garden designer and I had made the move from the UK to Delaware and then from Delaware to Indiana. And that was where I began to realize how important place was. I now know that that's the um, eco region, but still I was learning which plants did well and why. And then I met Neil through the Indiana Native Plant Society's um, annual conference. He came as speaker to our first one. And I'd already had this concept of needing a book that would tell me what a plant was coming through the ground. At that stage, this was because of my clients who were getting really frustrated because in spring, they would go out there and see these plants coming through, didn't know if they were weeds or if they were the plants we planted. I had already experienced that when I was a very new gardener back in the UK. I only started gardening in my late twenties, um, which is surprising for a Brit, but still. Um, and we inherited from the people who sold us the house a garden that was mostly a huge perennial border because the guy we bought it from had been the head gardener at the manor house in the village that we lived in. And at home, he had developed this beautiful garden. Well, I even have a picture. I, I should have put that up, but um, I have a picture of me sitting on the ground that first spring looking at this perennial border. I knew what daffodils were, I knew what the tulips were, but everything else that was coming through the ground, I had no clue. And from that point on, I went to look for a book. There wasn't a book. And that book didn't arrive until our book came out. So um, this developed as I learned more about native plants that had evolved in regions that could deal with the climate that they lived in, something that in the UK we don't even have to worry about. Um, but in Indiana, the first year we were there, it went down to minus 25. Another year later, it went, I mean, several years later, it went down to minus 29. And what did I discover? which plants came back and thrived they didn't die prairie plants and having met neil and then having clients who were beginning to ask for prairie plantings um i asked him if we could do this book and as he has just described that's where it came from and you come 
it might be helpful if we explain to people what's actually in the book. Um, because we started out with the uh, pictures, which is the heart of the book, are illustrating the flowers and grasses, mostly mostly flowers, but there's, there's 18 grasses and one sedge. And it's hard to do all the sedges, and there's not that many really great prairie sedges. But uh, what we also included here, besides these specific detailed photos, is a history of the prairie, how it originated, and co-evolved co with ungulates, grazing animals, as well as the ecology of prairie plants. And, the, and understanding the ecology of the plants in your garden is really important. And this is not a commonly taught uh, aspect of gardening, is understanding what's going on underground. But the average prairie plant, flowers and grasses, approximately two-thirds of their living biomass occurs underground. And so we never think of that because we don't see it. But when you're designing a garden, it's very important to know not just what's above ground, but also what is below ground. And what makes prairie grass, prairie gardens generally lower maintenance than a typical prairie, perennial garden is the inclusion of grasses and heavily uh, dense fibrous rooted flowers or forbs. So the dense roots help to prevent open soil, which is where weeds get established. So it's really important that you include grasses in your prairie gardens if you want them to be low maintenance. So we want to make sure and explain the ecology of grassland ecosystems and how the principles of ecology are applied in the actual garden itself. And once people understand that, then they have the tools with which they can use to design their gardens. And the nice thing about the grasses also is that most of the prairie grasses, not all, but most of them are warm season grasses. And so they really shine later in the season after most of the flowers are done. So you're able to extend the interest of that garden into, or, or prairie meadow, whichever, um, but gardens in particular, you're able to extend that in season of interest all the way into the winter, long after the flowers are garden. Of course, I love doing what we call CSI botany, where you tell the plants by their dental records. You go out and look at the seed heads or the, the sold stems. And uh, a lot of those stems that you leave up over the winter actually have ornamental value. And of course, they're of great value to birds uh, foraging for seeds. And many um, invertebrates, including pollinators, et cetera, will overwinter in stems on, in the leaf material below the, uh, at the ground level, uh, in the seed heads, depending on the structure of the plant. And so it's really important to leave that prairie stand up over the winter in most cases. So we want to make sure and explain to people the aspects of the ecology of the prairie and the individual characteristics of the root system, which is why we list the root types, whether they're fibrous rooted or they're a bulb or a corm, which is a corm is like a bulb or if they're a taproot, or if they're a rhizome, so people understand how they're going to behave and how they fit together in that underground uh, living space where it's so important that you understand for your prairie garden. Then we uh, give specifics on um, gardening. We don't want to write a whole gardening book because there's millions of gardening books, but just the general concepts of how to garden with prairie plants. And then ecological restoration of larger areas using seeds and site preparation before you seed and then post-planting management, including when to seed, how, uh, how much seed to use, how to apply the seed, depending on the size and scale of the project, and then the management, whether you're using mowing management, burning management, et cetera. And then we get into seed propagation and plant propagation, either from uh, vegetative divisions, cuttings, et cetera. And then finally, the fauna that are associated with prairie meadows and gardens. And then at the back of the book, equally important almost, are the tables. There are 30 tables. Uh, that describe the various characteristics of these plants. So it's for easy reference for people that want to see what kind of root systems they have, uh, how long the plants live. One of the uh, things that we included in this book that I don't think I've really ever seen in a book was plant longevity. How long do these plants live? Some are biennials, they live two years. Some are short-lived perennials, they live three to five years. Some are what we call early successional perennials, they live five to 10 years and then they tend to fade out. And then you get into longer lived plants that live 10 to 20 years. And then you have the Methuselah prairie plants that live 20 years or longer. So I've been doing this for 45 years. So I have at least some perspective, at least I can get you up to 45 years on this, but there are some plants that I planted 45 years ago that are still alive today. So we don't really know. And other people would, would share this and say, yeah, um, these plants, some of these plants like compass plant, prairie dock and big blue stem and prairie drop seed, who knows how long they live, a hundred years? 200 years, some of these plants could live as long or longer than certain species of trees. And so this is some of the un misunderstood aspects of these herbaceous plants that have, in some cases, extraordinary lifespans 
and are very conservative plants behaviorally. So it's really quite fascinating as you dig into the ecology of the individual species and, and start to understand the complexity of this plant community. And what we try and explain to people and to, to, uh, to provide insight to is that this is not just a garden. This is a community of plants working together to create a diverse mini ecosystem on your property that supports a, a wide diversity of uh, insects, pollinators, soil microorganisms, uh, uh, everything, all the way up to all the way up the food web. And a lot of people say, well, if I plant a prairie, am I going to get like mice? And I'm going to go, oh, I hope so. And people say, well, why? Because, well, do you like hawks? Well, yeah, I love hawks. Do you like owls? Yeah, owls are great. What do hawks and owls eat? Well, mice and voles and shrews and rabbits. And if they don't have that food, you won't have your hawks and you won't have your your owls, because that's a very important part of their of their of their whole uh, their whole diet. So people have to begin to understand interconnectedness. And I'm so I mean, wild ones people they get this. We're not you know we're preaching preaching to the choir, but for the average individual, you know they're scared to death by bacteria and fungi and, and critters. It's like hey, let's get over it. You know we share this planet. There's an abundance of life out there. Yes, of course there are dangers, but if you want diversity and beauty, you got to share it. That means there's going to be some critters out there that you may not like but it's absolutely essential to the survival of all the other life forms on the planet. So we hope that we are fostering an appreciation, not just of prairie plants and prairie gardens, but of the whole web of life that can be associated with prairies and other native plants, shrubs, trees, etc. So that was our goal was to provide a reference and at the same time, share our reverence and love of prairie plants and all, all life. So Neil, do you want to go into, we, we covered the root systems there, um, the various ways that prairie plants actually um, learn to protect themselves. Hillary, you did the legwork on this. I'm going to, I'm going to defer to you. Take it away. <laughs> well, we have various ways of um, protecting ourselves when we're plants. Uh, some of, of those would be turning or actually, this isn't protecting ourselves. This is making the most of um, the beneficial sun is when the leaves will face in the direction of the sun, which is what we're looking at in the sylphium down below. And above, you see we've got the gray hairs on the leaves. That's something you'll see here in Arizona everywhere because the leaves are protecting themselves with those hairs. They don't lose the moisture in the plant quite as much as they do. It doesn't evaporate so easily off leaves that have these hairs. Another way that a plant will protect itself is to wilt like this. This is ironweed. And this was in my own yard back in Indiana. Um, and this was wilting in a hundred and something degree uh, sun. And a few hours later, it rained and it stood right back up. And so that you see, it doesn't affect it at all. That's the same plant later um, in the year, flowering beautifully right outside my window. These protective um, What's the word I'm looking for, Neil? <laughs> the uh, mechanisms, adaptation. That's the word I'm looking for. Thank you. Um, are in plants throughout, uh, whether it's the woods or the prairie. And it's just that we don't often understand what's going on. I would have clients asking, why is my plant drooping? Why is my plant doing this? And I would try and explain that this is what the plant was doing. It was using its self-protective abilities. Neil, I think you need to take this one, perhaps, the carbon dioxide capture. Sure. Um, many of the prairie grasses, the warm season prairie grasses, like big blue stem, little blue stem, Indian grass, switchgrass, these are what we call C4 grasses because they have a four carbon chain carbon, uh, carbon dioxide capture 
um, at the stomata where the air exchange is made when the plants release oxygen as a waste product and take up carbon dioxide to form sugars metabolically. So the typical plant has a C3, a three carbon chain. I'm not going to go into the details of the chemistry, but they're generally referred to as C3 and C4 carbon capture mechanisms. Average plants have, most plants have a C3 capture program or me methodology. Uh, C4 plants, which also includes some non-grasses, but mostly are the, grass, are the grasses, is about, uh, I think, about 100 times as efficient as C3. So they are able to capture carbon dioxide much more quickly, thus the stomata stay open for a shorter period of time. And the stomata are mostly on the undersides of the leaves, very rarely on the top, but on the undersides of the leaves where the air exudes in and out of the leaf. And so if you can only open that stomata for a short period of time because your carbon capture is more efficient, you lose less water. So it's a great adaptation for hot, dry conditions. And you look at where the tall grass prairie, and our book is about the eastern tall grass prairie, as you saw in the map that Hillary showed earlier. Um, these areas are subject to extreme temperatures, relatively speaking, for, for the Midwest, and both high in the summer and cold in, in the winter, and drought and wind. So the three enemies of plants are heat, lack of rain, um, and well, enemies, when I say enemies, I mean climatically, and wind speed. And that's why if you get to the Great Plains where you get 10 to 15 inches of rain a year, and the wind is incessant, and the relative humidity is always almost always low, the average height of plants is so much lower, and that's the short grass prairie, which we didn't cover in this book. It's a completely different ecosystem. But the plants are forced into being lower because they have to stay out of the wind where they're desiccated. They don't have enough moisture and rainfall usually to grow very tall. So these are big factors. But in the tall grass prairie, where you get 30 to 40 inches of rain a year, you can grow big plants. But when you get a drought, like we had this year, and the drought of 2012, and the drought of 88, and the drought of 76, and I remember the drought of 36. That was the worst one ever, let me tell you. But uh, uh, the state high temperature in Wisconsin, uh, highest temperature ever recorded was 114 degrees on July 13th, 1936. I've seen 108. So these plants are in a continental climate and they're subject to extended drought and heat, some pretty miserable weather. And so they have to be tough enough to survive this. And it really is amazing what they do. They can go into temporary dormancy, or in this case with the grasses, you have C4 carbon capture, so they can be more efficient when they are still growing during these hot, hot conditions. Again, in this chapter, we cover the modern prairie restoration. So Neil, over to you again. Uh, modern prairie restorations go back to the first restoration attempts that were made at the University of Wisconsin Madison um, Curtis Arboretum, which at the time was not the Curtis Arboretum, but um, Aldo Leopold and John Curtis and some other ecologists and professors there transplanted big hunks of sod that they dug up in native prairies and brought them into these old agricultural fields in the mid 1930s. And the results were um, sketchy at best because, of course, taprooted plants don't transplant well, so they had some losses. And then over time, they refined this method so that they started experimenting with seeds and started seeding prairies, which is way more efficient than digging up big, huge hunks of sod and transporting them from prairie remnants that you're destroying. So it evolved into um, really into seeding in the, in the 40s and 50s. And then they discovered burning management was essential in the mid-40s because it helped control cool season weeds and grasses by timing the burning and usually in mid-spring, depending on what your goals are. And then uh, Illinois, Iowa, Minnesota, other universities, and so it was really an academic process. These were academics trying to restore the ecology of an endangered ecosystem. When you look at the tall grass prairie, there's less than one-tenth of one percent remaining that it was all plowed up because the soils it produced were so incredibly rich and it was almost uh, eliminated. We have a lot more rainforest than we have prairie like way more, because we basically ripped the whole thing up for corn and beans and wheat and alfalfa. But the prairie uh, restoration movement, or whatever you want to call it, was an academic pursuit at universities. And then it branched out into homeowners really pretty much in the 70s when people started realizing, hey, I can put these in my garden. So it wasn't until really the 1970s, and then it started to take off in the 80s, and it really took off in the 90s. And, and again, once people started understanding the connection between native plants and pollinators and you got to give 90 percent of the credit to doug tallamy because he's the man with bringing nature home who showed definitively what we all kind of thought and we kind of knew but we didn't really know well doug proved it in bringing nature home that there are inextricable links between our native pollinators and our native plants and he worked primarily with, with trees and shrubs but the work he's done beyond with pollinators and native ours etc showing that open pollinated plants are really the answer for preserving biodiversity 
So this whole whole movement started almost 100 years ago in Wisconsin. And it's very interesting. You know, we're in the flyover Midwest, but uh, as far as um, being progressive, as far as ecological restoration, it started in the upper Midwest and it took a long time to get to California and New York. So we were way ahead of the coast on this one. Okay, on to chapter three. And I think what we'll do through this, all I've done is take the headings in our book and um, I'll just list them because you'll see what we cover in the book. We won't go into detail right now. There are going to be questions on some of this stuff as well. So um, we can just look at what we have in the book that we have covered in detail. And if we tried to do that here, it would take 22 years. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this is this is so important because when I work with clients, the first question I ask is, what is your soil type and your drainage? And before we, we can do anything, we have to know what plants will grow in your environment. So number one, we start with the soil and of course the light conditions. So soil, drainage, and light, and any other mitigating circumstances on the site are what we ask. So it's so important that everybody understand their soil. And we provide people with the information on how to tell what your soil type is so you can make an accurate assessment. So then we go on to chapter four, which is designing, planting, and maintaining prairie gardens. And again, I think we'll just list the headings because we again go into great detail on exactly how to do all of this um and if we tried that again this would take way too long um, another 20 years <laughs> yes another 22 years <laughs> uh, the, the converting a lawn to a prairie garden i've i've found that to be the simplest way for people they seem to um actually get that there are the tips for designing prairie gardens and there's actually one of the examples that we give um, and as Neil was talking about before the root systems which are vital when you're designing um, gardens you need to know what the root systems are and actually Neil covers that in his seed mixes really really well because he he knows exactly what plants need to be planted together sown together to create um, the prairie sod, I guess. So we've got the taproot, the bulb, and the corms, and then the grasses will hold the soil around those which do not hold soil. Um, planting the prairie garden, garden maintenance, this is where my job is. Um, I still do both of those, the planting the prairie garden. I've been working with a client in Indiana um, just this last few months, um, the prairie garden maintenance. I have a crew out there maintaining my prairies back in Indiana. And then there's year-end maintenance, prairie garden designs, and we list the um, possibilities, uh, which if you go to the seed mix tables or to the other tables, um, you can create any one of these gardens using the tables to figure out which plants you want for those particular types of garden. And to match them to your soil, because we list the soil types. Yes. And there are tables that just list uh, flowers by color. So if you yeah. want purple, purple yeah. flowers, you look at the table, if you want red flowers, which there are not very many, yellow flowers, white flowers. And here's what's really interesting. People often think of prairies as being, oh, just a bunch of yellow composites, but you know, that's of the dominant in the latter part of the season. But the second most common color of flowers in the prairie is white. And so you have great opportunities to mix whites with blues and purples and lavenders to create more pastel-y type gardens. And you can create a beautiful prairie garden with no yellow at all. Some people have an aversion to yellow, yep. you know, yep. that cheap right. and yellow, you know, but, but so there are many different opportunities and you can use those tables to select the plants that you want to match it to your soil, to your sun conditions, to your height, desired height. So it's a really uh, effective way to develop a plant palette for a particular garden design if you're so inclined. And now on to the main section of the book, the chapter five, which is the Prairie Species Field Guide. And um, I've just given some examples that come directly from the book. 
We've got some monocots such as the Tradescantia ohiensis. And what I've tried to do is show here we have a flower and here we have the seed. And most people wouldn't recognize that this is the seed head on the Tradescantia. So in the book, that's very obvious. You know, if we can back up. Sorry. Can we, can we, yeah. Can we back up. Yeah. Yeah. Go back one. Yeah. This is interesting. Um, normally, you look at that and you say, "Oh, that's all green. That seed's not ripe." But we know in in the book is that Tradescantia, uh, Ohioensis and Brachiana, when these species are the seeds are ripe, their their seed heads are still green, and you might actually have a few stray blooms. Okay. Mm -hmm. If you wait until they turn brown, all the seeds have dropped. So if you're a seed collector, you need to know when to collect the seeds. So we make sure to note collect the seed when it's still green, but the, the flowers have just started or maybe just one bloom left or else you won't have anything. Now, anybody that's collected Tradescantia knows that you'll end up with inky blue hands as part of this process, but it's easy to wash off and it's not toxic. Thank you, Hillary. Okay, no problem. And Cicerinchium albidum, I included this one because it's one of my favorites. Um, we collected the seed for the Millennium Seed Bank for this, um, which is as far as I know, the only Cicerinchia that you can recognize at the emerging through the ground stage because of the red sheath. Um, I've looked at many other Cicerinchium and not seen that. Neil, correct me if you've seen it, but I haven't. You've probably seen more Cicerinchium than I have. Yep. Um, down in the Barrens, obviously, we had several. Right. Yep. Um, Antenaria neglecta, this, we're into the dicots now in flower and these are those gray leaves that we're talking about this is an emerging this is a seedling isn't it it's a seedling yep. yeah mm -hmm. so yep. it looks really really healthy at a very early stage eutrochium now um eutorium and fistulosum the whole plant there and you see the identifying feature of this plant is that whirl of leaves around the stem very distinctive out of the eutrochiums silphium perforatum who doesn't know the cup plant and has anybody ever tried drinking water out of those um, you can collect it it's what the settlers did and before them of course the people who lived there um, they knew how to collect the water from the leaves. And I included the immature seed head on this one because it is so beautiful. <laughs> I wish people would stop to look at the plants closely at all different stages. You know, some of the prairie plants are more attractive in the seed stage than they are in the flower stage, like prairie smoke. How do you grow prairie smoke? You don't grow it for that little pink flower. You grow it for those beautiful fleecy pink and white seed heads. And uh, there's a number of other species that are equally attractive in the seed form if you just look as they are in the flower form. Yep. And you can use them as you, as we note in the tables, you can use them in dried arrangements. So um, on to Calaroi in Volucrata. Everybody, I think, knows this as a ground cover. Um, I'm obviously coming from the, the designer uh, side of things. So these things appeal to me, not just to me, but for my clients. And the seed heads on these, they're just wild. I love those seed heads. That's a mature seed head of Calaroi and Volugrata. Rosa citidra. We didn't include many of the roses, but this one is it was growing on my fence in Indiana. Um, you can identify all of those roses by their thorns. And so when you see thorns looking like this, you know that you've got Rosa citidra, even when there's no leaves. The emerging leaves are so spring, they, they mean spring to me. And then you get the benefit of the rose flowers. So again, this is what we're trying to show is each stage, even with a shrub or a rose, 
we get the emerging leaf coming off the stem so you know what you're looking at. Verbena hastata, one of those showy plants in a prairie garden. The seed heads are just as beautiful as the flower itself in our minds. I think you agree with me on that, Neil. Yes, and I tend to devil of a time getting a decent photo of those seed heads. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, I don't know why that one was so hard. <laughs> it, well, the light catches them differently anyway. It, it reflected terribly, didn't it? Yes, it did. Um, On to a couple of grasses, Bootalua curtipendula, the flowers. And do you know how many people have told me that grasses don't flower? <laughs> I have argued with people walking on trails, and I have to stop and say, here. Here is a grass. Here's the flower. <laughs> and as you can see, they're really, really pretty. And the seed head, again, getting the seed head, um, that was a difficult picture, but we got it. You know, I think the, the flowers of Cytos gram and Indian grass are absolutely gorgeous. And you just have to stop and look. Yes. And we're in, we're in these busy, hurried lives. And we don't lay down in the grass and look up at those clouds oh, know, yeah. as much as we might want to and, and i'm as guilty as anybody but if you just stop and take a minute and look at the beauty of nature and it's just it's 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 refreshing for the soul and i, I hope that this helps people hopes this helps people take a closer look and realize the just incredible beauty of the world around us and this aerogross is spectacular and this is literally what a couple of miles from you neil About, and I'm yeah. driving home to Indiana from Neils, and there's this swath all along the roadside. And I had to stop and get that picture. That is a grass that any, I think I could even persuade my, I did actually persuade my clients to grow because a lot of my clients did not want grasses in their gardens. And I thought the ligule on this one is just as good as the flowers. It is <laughs> so very tufted at the ligule. It's a really, really easy identifying feature. The sorgastrum with the flowers again, when, and I did, I was lying on the ground, Neil, taking that picture, looking up at all of the sorgastrum in flower. It's just beautiful. And yes, grass is flower. And this is what that looks like when it's had a burn. It's been burned. This, I think, was it yours, Neil? Um, yeah, it was in my garden. Yep. Yep. And back it comes. They are really good at coming back after being burned. I'm watching that up on the mountain here in Mount, um, Mount Lemon in Arizona, where we had a fire that took over 100,000 acres in 2020 and i was up there a couple of days ago and the aspen are re-sprouting the oaks are definitely re-sprouting new baby pines are growing so fire is in some cases actually necessary for these things to thrive you know, so establishing... there we go yes neil I just got a side comment um, something that's not generally appreciated is that most, not all, but most ecosystems in North America are are subject to fire at some point of their life cycle. Mm -hmm. and there are exceptions, of course, but fire has always been a part of prairies, savannas, marshes, um, many, many forests, and uh, not not just lodgepole pine and other serotonous cone species that, that need their need fire for their cones to open up for seeds to disperse but redwoods um, all these all these different types of fire uh, ecosystems are subject to fire whether it's annually every five years every 500 years there are usually fire events associated with them so it's uh and prairies of course are the most classic one because they are truly born to burn because you have all that fine fuel that is so easy to to start and carry but it's important for people to know that fire is a, a really important part of the ecosystem and beware do not put your million dollar house in a lodgepole pine forest like people do on the eastern slope of colorado and then wonder why their house burned down 
on to chapter six and we'll i think just click through neil if you have anything to add designing prairie meadows the site selection tall and short prairies early middle and late successional prairie species spring versus fall seeding frost seeding um, we cover all of these things in detail site preparation seeding prairie into formal laws which as i say is what i've done mostly for my clients seeding crop fields i haven't ever attempted that neil told me not to do it at my own house because weeds seeds would germinate from 60 years back because it was farmland you had you had mitigating circumstances but, yes yeah you know this chapter is really important because this is the most complicated method of of a prairie gardening or prairie restoration gardens are relatively simple putting in a prairie garden is really not that much different from putting in a perennial garden you you look at the ecology of the plants more closely than you will with a perennial garden but by matching up the root systems the foliage etc you can you can put together a prairie garden relatively simply but doing a prairie restoration or prairie meadow from seed is much more complicated because you don't have the option of going in and pulling weeds on five acres yeah. that you do in a garden you don't have the tools that you have available in a smaller space so you have to get it right from the start which means that you have to make sure you have really good site preparation that the weeds are under control the weeds and uh, aggressive grasses are completely under control so you need to follow those steps and that chain is only as strong as the weakest link. So you have to get every phase of this correct. That's why we want to make sure and provide all this detail to people so they have a template that they can use. And there are variable methods and different approaches to this so people can select the one that is best for their situation. And there are other um, circumstances like how do you work on slopes that are subject to erosion? So there's all sorts of different factors you have to take into consideration. What is the best time to seed? What is the safest time to seed if you have an erodible site? So we want to make sure and address all the different uh, scenarios that people might run into. So we go on um, to the prairie seeding methods. And again, it's all covered in the book in great detail. Um, Post planting management and weed control. That's one of the ones that I get all the time. And first year second year because it changes as the years go on third year and beyond burning and mowing and mowing was what i had to do because my clients were in residential areas and some of them had trees they didn't want to get burned so we did the mowing management you know my, sorry go ahead my, my first boss told me you know neil you can solve a lot of landscape problems with a chainsaw Get those trees out of the prairie, dang it. <laughs> <laughs> no, they don't belong in the prairie. Well, if you maybe a bur oak or a hickory. But anyway, I'm I'm being a little facetious. But but okay. no, this, you know, why did I get into prairie? Because you get to burn things. That was my main motivation. Right. We're power of <laughs> yes. Exactly. If you, if you have pyromaniacal tendencies, this is like, hey, I can channel this in a positive direction. Ooh, and I don't do buildings, only prairies. And as you will see in the next chapter. Um, he does just that. <laughs> so we have all of these. We cover those, the plateau resistant prairie seedings. This is definitely Neil's side of things. I don't use chemicals. Um, we go on to chapter seven, burning your prairie safely. And here we have Neil as pyromaniac. Um, <laughs> setting fire. This is at his own property. These are little baby fires. Yes, they are. These are boring baby fires at my place. I, I didn't put the one of the tornado. <laughs> but, you know, under control is good. And you'll notice here that, um, first of all, you make sure that your fire breaks are in place and that they're defensible. And notice that you start with the backfire. If you look at the, the third slide from the left, you can see that the fire has started on uh, against the wind. And so it burns into the wind very slowly and very, very controllably. If you look in the lower right hand corner, you can see we're developing what is called a black line, the point where the fire has burned from right to left. Again, see how it's stubbing its toe? It's being pushed back because you're burning into the wind. I'm burning from east to west. We have prevailing westerly winds. And so this is in the evening when it's cooler 
wind speeds are lower, relative humidities are higher, the chances of you losing a fire are much less, and the, the rate of burn is much reduced compared to two o'clock in the afternoon when it would burn with uh, much more ferocity. So you're able to completely control it. And then in the center, lower center, once I've got the black line in, it's time to have some fun and you're burning up the hill and you wouldn't normally burn uphill, but I've got a good fire break at the top of that hill. <clears throat> and I had to get this done before dark, so I let it rip. And it's way more fun that way anyway. No yeah, more left. I'm too. There you go. <laughs> and then you can see the, the lower left, uh, the beautiful black landscape, which will be green within a matter of days as the plants green up. So propagating prairie plants from seed in chapter eight. Um, again, we'll just go through the headings in the chapter. Seed harvesting, cleaning and storage. I hope that everybody eventually gets around to harvesting some seeds because and, and then um, growing them because that experience of growing your own plants from your own plants is some it, it's a feeling we've lost. It's a connection we've lost. Harvesting prairie grass seed, harvesting prairie flower seeds, drying prairie seeds, seed cleaning, processing, storing seed, and then seed germinating. Um, dry stratification, moist stratification, timing of moist stratification, pre-treatment, scarification. These are big words that a lot of people just have never heard. And so um, we explain exactly what they mean and how to go about it. Fleshy fruited seeds is one of the things that people are asking all the time. So uh, again, we do cover that and double dormant seeds, the timing of seed sowing, planting freshly collected seed, um, knowing which plants you can do that with, and which ones uh, don't work so well that way. So starting prairie seeds indoors. And again, you've got the same issues, the watering, and I use capillary matting, which allows plants to um, get the water from below instead of being watered from above. And I have found over the decades that you get almost 100% seed germination and very little die off of the um, seedlings with the capillary mapping. And the trouble is that. then that my clients who've been doing this with me, um, they find that they suddenly have a hundred plants where they, if they'd gone out and bought it, they would have bought one or maybe three. <laughs> and now they don't know how to deal with a hundred plants because they have to, <laughs> they have to pop them on. <laughs> And that, just to point out, you you uh, you use the capillary matting to avoid overhead watering, which can lead to moist leaves and damping off fungal losses. Correct? Yes. Yeah. Fertilizing, I do that in the reservoir that you use with capillary matting. Um, I add the fertilizer to the water; it just goes straight through into the roots of the plant. Hardening off and transplanting and then propagating plants by seeding directly into the soil, site preparation. Again, there's quite a bit of work involved in that. Watering and fertilizing, weed control, and you do have to do that. Um, something some of my clients like, and some of them don't. Digging and transplanting seedlings. So on to chapter nine, propagating prairie plants vegetatively root division and again this is one of the big ones i would have my clients come around to my garden and we would all get out there and start digging up my plants and dividing and they would learn the different kinds of root systems that those plants had and they get to go home with new plants for their gardens and i get the work of the division done <laughs> which was very helpful the timing of root division and I would have them come around like three or four times a year um, to get the timing right for the different plants. Dividing fibrous rooted plants, dividing rhizomatous plants. And again, some of these are more difficult than others. Protecting fall divisions. And I did most of my divisions in fall, but where it was appropriate. Dividing bulbs, 
non-divisible tap-rooted plants and that was something the clients don't like it. they because they want to divide them and then realize they've torn the root in half have you ever seen that neil oh yes 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 i did some experiments on that myself much to my chagrin yes it kills the plant um stem cuttings <laughs> taking cuttings oh. yes you know if you if you cut a if you take a, a foot off the top of a compass plant it'll re-sprout from that root a foot below the ground yeah the, the piece you take off the top will probably die but it will come almost always come back from that root because that you go eight nine ten feet deep or more yeah yep so um stem cuttings taking the cuttings sticking the cuttings care of the new cuttings but they're all covered in chapter nine now we're on to chapter 10 and this is the prairie food web and quite honestly this is probably the most important um consideration for prairie plantings because what we're doing with our prairie planting is we're helping to um save our world we're helping to save even the human race with planting plants that attract the insects of course everybody loves the butterflies they're not so keen on moths except for the hummingbird moth because that's a daytime moth and it's pretty they don't like the caterpillars of that one let me tell you <laughs> the bees carpenter bee and bumblebee um all of these are acceptable in people's gardens um except they're not so keen on the carpenter bee but i could go into some detail about that that might make them accept them better flies and wasps these are not so acceptable um and uh, this is a parasitic wasp actually ovipositing in its host um caterpillar and then our friendly garden spider and a lot of people don't even want those in their gardens and it's uh, trying to explain just how vital these insects are um Doug does a much better job than I do. And you know, a garden spider web with morning frost on it is a piece of jewelry. It's just the most gorgeous piece of artwork. It is. And, and people and, walk out of their yards and walk straight into it, in the, their face. <laughs> and they complain. But I, I think slowly but surely, people are are changing and we're seeing and and largely due to groups but like wild ones because what is the wild ones always has been a wild one's most important product is education the same with prairie nursery we have education first yeah we sell plants and seeds but first and foremost we have to educate people on why native plants are important and that's one of the great things that wild ones does is it's an educating organization to help people understand the importance of biodiversity and why these things that we've been brainwashed that are being bad are completely utterly fallacious and have no no foundation in, in okay. science or reasonability and it's to our own demise that we that we destroy our fellow fellow travelers on the planet and that's one of the great things about wild ones and, and the wonderful people that, that make up this organization and spread the good word and i wanted to say that this book says it all nature's best hope that's what we are by bringing in all of these creatures to our gardens and educating people that these are vital Doug's book, Nature's Best Hope. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so let's make sure everybody knows that's Doug telling me. One of his, many of his great publications. My favorite is still nat the, uh, the Nature of Oaks, Doug. Um, the birds, and these are outside Neil's because um, I have to go down to southeastern Arizona to get the sandhill cranes. But one of the things I hear in my head is when I, we're out there taking the pictures for the book, I can hear the sandhill cranes. And just uh, my shoulders go down, my whole being relaxes because I'm out there. And of course, we have the owls, the hunters on the prairie. These are just obviously a few of the, the creatures. Over towards the west, we've got the small mammals like the... Um, Blackfoot, Blackfoot. Yep. Mm -hmm. 
um, reptiles and amphibians we have all over the country. This one was when I was seed collecting. It, I stood up and came face to face with that in the Barrens in Kentucky. And this was a snake, a garter snake at Neils. And then the canines, the coyote, the wolf, which we see too little of, unfortunately. And the ungulates, and Neil can tell you a little bit about how the bison are so beneficial to the prairie. Yeah, I mean, the bison, interestingly, this is, this is something that we miss ecologically. If you read the early accounts of European explorers that came across the Midwestern prairies, the tall grass prairie of Illinois, Wisconsin, Minnesota, Iowa, they commented on the incredible flower fields. And nowadays, one of the issues we have with prairie restorations is oftentimes the grasses can become dominant over an extended period of time of many decades. Why is that? Well, it's because there's an, a very important element that is missing from our modern prairie restorations in most cases, unless they're really big and you've got a big fence, you don't have grazers like bison and elk. And bison and elk primarily consume grasses and don't eat many flowers. And so they helped enforce the control of the grasses so you could have these fabulous flower meadows, but with, in the absence of these large ungulates and grazers that would pr predominantly remove the grass and weaken the grass to the, to the benefit of the flowers, we have issues with the grasses taking over. So we have to make sure in our initial design of a seed mix that we don't put too much grass seed in it so that the flowers will get a good start and be able to maintain a significant component. So this is the unfortunate thing about um, restored prairies uh, not in gardens, in gardens you have more control, but in restored seeded prairies, you want to be very careful you don't put too much grass in there because you're probably not going to turn out the bison and the elk to take care of it. So we're on to some of our tables. Um, I've put an example here, table 11.7, which is northern deer resistant short prairie mix for medium soil. Um, Deer resistant is something I am asked about still all the time by clients. How do I stop the deer from completely demolishing my garden? Um, and I have worked with that quite a bit. But Neil did it through his seed mixes, which is it simplifies things for everybody who's seeding a prairie. Um, here we have the Latin names the, uh, of the bulbs. And then if you go across, it tells you how many, um, how much you need of the seed mix per square foot. And then the grasses, which, um, again, Neil's better at the description of percentages that you need for these things. So this, this is an inherently um, low diversity mix because there's two factors that have been selected for here shorter lower growing plants which takes out a very significant number of the total plants available in terms of flowers and grasses and deer resistant so a typical mix that we would offer would have two double this or maybe three times as many species so this is actually one of the least diverse mixes uh, in the book and i think it's you selected it so it would fit on the screen i think primarily <laughs> because the others are so extensive but uh, just so people know when you look at this and you only see like 15 forbs and three grasses uh, that's because it's been selected for plants that are low growing and are not typically consumed by deer. Although this is not deer proof, it is deer resistant. Deer resistant, yes. Um, deer. As I say, it takes the guesswork out of um, which plants to use when you've got the seed mix right from the beginning. And a lot of my clients really appreciate that. And they also appreciate the lower growing grasses because a lot of my clients just didn't want grasses in their gardens at all. You know, this is interesting because uh, when we talked about the history of prairie restoration from the 30s at the uh, Arboretum at the University of Wisconsin in Madison, when I started doing prairie restoration in the late 1970s, the concept was you just wanted as much diversity as possible and you would get all these different prairie forbs, prairie flowers and grasses and maybe a few shrubs like lead plant, New Jersey tea, some roses, and you put it in a mix and you would just scatter it here and there and whatever came up, came up, which is a perfectly reasonable approach, but that doesn't work in an urban environment or in a small area. And so in the middle eighties, 
Well, after I'd gone into business, I was starving to death trying to sell weeds because, of course, all these plants were weeds in 1982 when I started doing this. Um, I came up with this idea that, hey, we don't have to th throw the whole prairie kit and caboodle into the mix. Let's just pick the shorter plants. And so I designed prairie seed mixes and prairie gardens that just had short plants. And there was those who were critical of it because, well, this isn't really a prairie because it doesn't have big blue stem or it doesn't have Indian grass or it doesn't have yellow cone flower. But you know what? My customers don't want eight foot tall grasses in their front yard. Mm -hmm. So let's find some compromise here where we can come up with a way that we can help convert lawns into reasonably good habitat. It may not have 35 species, but it'll have 20 species and we'll be covering the ecological niches of, of a grassland community where otherwise it would just be a mowed lawn. And so that was a really important break in the, in the uh, acceptance of prairies into urban and suburban landscapes by limiting the height of the plants and making them more appropriate for those sorts of applications. Thank you, Neil. And my clients appreciated it. <laughs> On to chapter 12, the tables. Um, and I've just used one example, um, deer resistant prairie plants. Once again, this is coming from my perspective where people just want plants that don't get eaten by the deer. We have them where there's um, low palatability. I picked out blue false indigo, Baptisia australis, and the descriptions that you will see in the tables. It tells you their bloom time. It tells you their zone that they grow in, the height they are, and then whether it takes full or part sun or shade. We haven't got one there. Um, medium soil moisture, soil texture, pH range. We didn't know the lower range of this. Um, so if anybody can come up with what the lower range of pH is for Baptisia australis, that would be helpful. We can add it to our book. Um, plants there were many we had. Done. Many we had done. Yeah. Yeah. And, and this is this pH range is really quite preliminary because a lot more research needs to be done on it. But we we included what we what little we knew. Yes. And um, plant spacing for prairie gardens. It's different in some cases than plant spacing for flower beds. So in this case, it actually is the same. Um, the root type, the plant life expectancy. So this is a long lived plant aggressiveness of method by its low by seed, whether it's good as a cut flower and whether it's good in dried arrangements as seed pods. We explain which way it's best to have that plant in a dried arrangement. Deer palatability for a medium um, plant, which is purple cornflower, they will eat purple cornflowers, they'll eat echinacea. Um, but it's not their favorite. And so there's less damage than there would be with some of the higher palatable um, plants, which I don't have an example right now. Um, and again, the height, the flower color, the bloom time, zone, and all of the rest of the information. We have all of that information for every single plant in our book, I believe. We are lost on the prairie. Um, that's a poem that's actually in the beginning of the book, but I've put it at the end here. Um, I haven't put the whole poem, but if Neil wants to read it out, I don't know if we have time for that, but I do want to hope and wish that everybody who's listening or watching us gets the chance to get lost on the prairie because the experience is something you can't even describe. I would love to read Michael's poem. It's one of my favorite parts of our book, but I don't think we have time because we do have questions that we uh, to answer here. So uh, if you do decide to purchase this book, it's the first part of the book, Lost on the Prairie by Michael Yanni. Michael Yanni is a premier woody plant propagator and he had uh an epiphany experience the first time we visited a prairie and he wrote this poem so i hope that you enjoy it if you buy the book thank you, thank you.
Thank you, Neil and Hillary, and thank you again to everyone for joining us. We hope you've gained valuable insights and knowledge. Before we get to our questions, we'd like to invite you to take another moment to consider supporting Wild One's mission. Your donation helps us continue our work and makes a positive impact. It funds ongoing education programs and supports our local chapters. Every contribution, big or small, brings us closer to our goal of native plants in every landscape. Lastly, please check the description in the chat for a link to our post-event survey. Your honest feedback greatly helps us improve our webinar experience. Now, let's take a few minutes for our speakers to answer some of the questions that were submitted at the time of registration. All right, let's start with questions. Number one, what is the smartest way to replicate the effect of periodic prairie fire and buffalo grazing slash trampling in a small suburban prairie planning? Well, I can do the prairie fire, but I can't do the trampling. And I wouldn't recommend it, but we'll, we'll, we'll address these one at a time. Um, I did a study back in 1980 where we burned a prairie and we mowed a prairie at approximately the same time. And then we did an intensive investigation of the frequency and of the prairie grasses and non-native pool season grasses. And we also did biomass studies where we clipped the grasses of each species on the different treatments. We had three treatments. One was burning, one was mowing and raking to simulate the effects of burning. And the other was a control where we left the standing grass from the previous year. And what we found was that mowing and raking at approximately the same time as you would burn a prairie to control cool season grasses, which included quackgrass, Kentucky bluegrass, meadow fescue were the primary uh, cool season grasses that we did not want in the prairie non-natives. And we wanted to favor the big blue stem, the little blue stem, the side oats grama, the Indian grass, and the switchgrass that were the warm season grasses. What we found was in that given year, and it can vary from year to year because of meteorological conditions, temperatures, rainfall, et cetera. What we found in that year was that mowing and raking was about 60% as effective as burning at the same time of year in controlling cool season grasses. It did not, we did not study cool season weeds. There weren't really many, very many cool season non-grassy weeds. But we also uh, did a visual assessment of where we used the same treatment on a prairie that had more flowers in it. it wasn't this, The first one was mostly grass to keep it simple. We burned some other prairies that had a better balance of flowers and grasses. And by July, you could not tell visually the difference between the burned plot and the mowed and rake plot. Now, when I say mowed, I mean you are mowing down to the ground. You're using a lawnmower to cut it right down to the soil level because your goal is to remove as much biomass, as much of the new growth of the undesirable cool season grasses because what you're doing is you're and this is the whole way burning works is if you are controlling cool season weeds that come up earlier sometimes four to six weeks earlier than some of your prairie plants depending on the species you allow them to expend their root reserves which weakens their roots but they haven't had time to replenish their roots with new sugars and energy through photosynthesis and then you mow their tops off but most of the prairie plants are still dormant under the soil so they are unaffected or marginally affected by this mowing or burning, depending on what you're doing. So you're depriving the target non-desirable plants by cutting them down preferentially before most of the prairie plants come up, weakening their roots. And after you burn, the soil turns black, which absorbs the, the sun and then increases the temperature of that soil into the range of much warmer temperatures that tend to favor warm season prairie plants, flowers and grasses. Not all of your prairie plants are, are warm season, so you will set back some of your cool season flowers and grasses but the vast majority of the prairie plants are warm season, are relatively unharmed by a mid-spring burn or mow and rake. So that is the theory behind it, is you're simulating the effects of burning by cutting it right down to the ground, removing as much of the, of the new green growth of the undesirable cool season grasses and cool season weeds if you have clovers, et cetera. And again, it was about 60% as effective. In some years, this was a hot, dry year, so it probably favored our results. If it's, if it's cool and wet after you perform this cutting and mowing, then you're probably not going to have the same level of control. As far as grazing and trampling, uh, because grazing and trampling of bison 200, 300, 400, 1,000 years ago, you, did, you were not subject to weed invasion of areas of soil disturbance. You had native prairie plants that were going to invade those new areas and create more early successional opportunities for the few annuals that are in a prairie, some biennials and, and early successional perennials. 
nowadays, it has, if you go in and rip up your prairie, you're probably going to get a whole bunch of weeds that you don't want. So I would not necessarily try and replicate something that occurred hundreds of years ago more effectively now that we have all these invasive plants that are going to take advantage of that situation. I was always wondering if you could, if you could simulate buffalo grazing uh, with a weed whacker. You become the buffalo and just selectively go in and, and whack a few of the of the particularly the grasses. Haven't tried it, but might be worth oh, trying. Here's a great thing to do. If you have a, a large enough area in a, in a seeded prairie, go in and mow it once a month. So mow it once in April, okay, to control, you know, like say mid-April. Do another one in mid-May. Do an, mm -hmm. Now here's where you get into trouble. If you have brown, ground nesting grassland birds, you could destroy nests. So you have to make sure that you're not disturbing nest nest. And there's always going to be some sort of disturbance. Okay. I mean Look at look at catastrophic windstorms that destroy mature forests. Okay, I mean na Mother Nature is not exactly kind, but if you can do this without dis without disturbing grassland birds or other wildlife, mow every month and look at the strips, and you will see a different. The response of the vegetation is fascinating, and so you'll get a mosaic of different uh, dominant plants, flowers, grasses, etc. In each of those mowed strips. So it's uh, yes, you can do that, and you can control the warm season grasses. If you get too much grass, you can go in there when they're in full bloom, usually in late July, early August, after grassland nesting birds have fledged and left the nest, so there's no danger of, of harming them. You go in there and mow that prairie down in late July, early August, when the grasses are at their most vulnerable because they're taking energy out of their roots to make seeds, make flowers and seeds. You can actually push the equilibrium of that ecosystem away from the taller grasses and more towards early spring and midsummer flowers. Uh, unfortunately, you will negatively affect the asters and golden rods and later season plants that are also mowed down at the same time as the grasses. But there's all sorts of ways to manage your prairie with mowing. So it's really interesting to mow once a month in the same prairie and see the response of the vegetation and take pictures. All right, next question. I'm trying to get started, but finding it daunting and expensive. Any advice? I, my advice is read this book. Uh, but. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Doug. <laughs> you know, this is interesting. Um, it doesn't say whether this individual is wanting to do this by seeds or by plants. Using transplants, like I said, you know, putting in a prairie garden is not that different from a perennial garden. It's just important for you to understand the ecology of the plants, the ecology of the community that you're creating, both at the foliar level, but also at the, at the soil and root level. Um, but the cost of a prairie garden is orders of magnitude more per square foot than the cost of seeding a meadow mm -hmm. because you're putting in plants at four or five, six dollars each, plus the labor is much more labor to put in plants than there is to scatter seed. So you have uh, a very significant difference in cost from a seeded meadow to a planted meadow. I mean, orders of magnitude more, like a hundred times more per square foot for plants and seeds. So it's hard to answer this without knowing what approach is being taken. But I always tell people if you're just starting out, start small. Don't go make a big mistake if you haven't done this before. Make small mistakes because you learn from small mistakes and then you have big successes. So whether you're doing seeding or, or transplants, start small, get a feel for it and experiment. Have fun with it. I found um, with some clients that using prairie plants in a raised bed gives them the opportunity they can do both the planting and some seeding in a raised bed and see how it works. And then they can transplant those things into a bigger bed when they feel confident and they like what they're doing. Um, yeah. Go ahead. And they're, they're segregating their plants, their transplants from their seeds. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Right. Sorry, I didn't mean... oh, sorry. Okay. What are your thoughts on local genotype? This is an important question. <laughs> How much time do we have? <laughs> do we have all day? Who wants to feel this one? Let's well, get this one back. We did Can discuss it yesterday. <laughs> and Neil's question was Do native plants seed themselves in different regions over time right Neil well it's a little more complicated than that but yes that was your question that was what you asked me yesterday do they yeah. move 
do they do they move? Yeah, not do they seed themselves, but how how mobile are plants? This yeah. is something that people tend not to appreciate. That plants are also mobile. They don't see them moving like animals. They're not flying. They're not running. Okay, but plants do move, and they are they are also assisted in movement by animals. And many of them are designed to latch onto animals or to be eaten by animals and transported to new locations. So plants are not static. And what always gets me is when people say, "Well, according to the plants that were here in 1840, I can't plant this because it was two counties away." It's like, um, well, uh, I don't think a plant knows that or cares about that. And a, a classic example, if you look at, and we can get into all sorts of discussions of evolution and what plants now have the advantage in this new world of the homeocene or whatever we're calling this, um, is that the plants, the native plants that are going to be more successful are those that have migrational pathways, which are those that are disseminated by wind. Okay, because the, the continuum of, of prairie ecosystems throughout the Midwest and the opportunities to move throughout there with animals and other mechanisms is gone because we have these little remnants that are separated from each other. And so if you're a large, heavy seed that doesn't fly or doesn't get carried around by other critters, you're at an evolutionary disadvantage right now. If you are a seed that is eaten by birds and carried all about, you are at evolutionary advantage. Okay, so the ones that fly and are assisted in their migration or movement by animals are the ones that are going to be the winners if they can fight it out with the invasives that are even more aggressive in many cases. Okay, so at this point, and then you have the added added element of of climate change. Okay, so it almost climate change basically levels this whole thing to what is the new local mm -hmm. ecotype. Okay. And what was a local ecotype, and I don't think of ecotypes as this is, this is cast in stone. I think there was an ecocline across the whole area of, of a plant community, of a plant, of the prairie. And you can see the variation in a given species as you move across different parts of the prairie, north to south and east to west. And you'll see some, some at least phenotypic variation, which is probably reflective of genotypic variation as you move through the United States. So was it ever just this, this is an ecotype here, that one's there? No, it's probably this, this mix. And then you have the question of what is the genetic plasticity of a given gene pool within a local plant community? And can you move it two degrees north to south, three degrees, four degrees? Uh, how far east or how far west can it go? And every species will be different. So there is no hard and fast rule as far as where do we draw the lines on local ecotype. But obviously it's important. We know it's important. Studies have shown that it's important. So it's a matter of degree, and how do we estimate that? And should we be moving southern plants north, pronto, because things are happening so fast that the actually you may be at a disadvantage by using local ecotype mm -hmm. because of climate change. So who knows? Who knows? I don't have any answers. I just have questions. Like keep in mind, if any seed that is dispersed by a migrating bird, that bird can fly up to 300 miles in one night. So yeah. there is a lot of movement. All right, moving yeah, on. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you. Okay. Should I try to manage my backyard prairie garden or just let them fight it out? You want to hit this on Hillary? <laughs> I have more than one answer to that. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> um, depending on how big that backyard prairie garden is um, and what plants they are considering they don't want in there might be. Um, I would suggest in a smaller space, yes, go in there and manage it. But in general, especially in a well-established planting, I would let them fight it out. And I've done both. I had a bed that I called my duke it out bed, where <laughs> I let these plants grow. They were all prairie plants. And what I saw over time, this is just my observation, was that one year one plant would be dominant and the following year, it would be barely visible and another plant would be dominant. And that would cycle 
over time. So um, letting them duke it out was the answer I wanted for that bed because I didn't have time to deal with it. For other beds in a more formal planting, yes, I would go and manage it. Weeding, you know, watering, fertilizing, whatever. I never fertilize mine, but um, some clients do. Any tips or guidance you could provide on the best overwintering mulch for native perennials, as well as when or even if to remove it in the spring? That would be appreciated. I'd be happy to weigh in on this one if that's okay with you, Hillary. Yeah, go ahead. I don't use okay. mulch. <laughs> okay. Um, I will use mulch when I put in fall transplanted prairie plants. That's the only time. Well, it depends. That's not necessarily true. But when I put in plants in the fall, they can be vulnerable to winter losses. So what I do is I mark each transplant that I put in September, October. I've even done it as late as December, which is insane. But it works if you do this. And then I get those little steel wire flags with little plastic colors on them and stick them by each plant. And you can color code them or just write a code on them so you know what the species is. Okay, and then I cover it with six inches of clean, weed-free winter wheat straw. And the beauty of winter wheat straw is that it provides a dense blanket, or not actually a loose blanket, with air pockets in it that prevent rapid uh, temperature changes. And it's not necessarily the extreme temperatures that kill plants, it's the rate of change. And so you are basically buffering the rate of change to those plants over winter, so they're not, not exposed to really rapid changes. Then in the spring, where each of those little posts, where these, those little flags are, you just take back this, the straw about two to three inches in diameter where the root crown is, and then the plants will emerge up through that, leaving the straw in place because the six inches of straw over winter where we live with snow will be about two inches, and now you have the perfect mulch to hold in moisture and prevent weed growth. So it's a really basically a triple duty approach for fall planting. And I use this also for spring, for spring planting, so to prevent weeds and to hold moisture in. So I use it in the spring as well, if I can. Some people use pre-emergence, but this is an organic approach where you just put it after you, after you put in the plants. And in the spring, you usually have leaves where you can see it, so you don't have to mark them with flags. You just put the mulch around it. I'm not a big fan of, of bark mulch mm -hmm. because berries are grasslands. They're not bark lands. They're not tree, you know, they're not trees. Okay, and beware those pine nuggets. You, I had a client that didn't follow directions and they put those doggone pine chunks around their prairie plants and killed half of their plants because there are weird chemicals in those in those uh, pine, spruce, bark nuggets. So avoid those at all costs. Should we be focusing on plants that thrive in our local soils or are there ways to add or manipulate the soils to accommodate more native species? Again, more than one answer. Yes. Yeah. Yes. You want to go for it. Well, we can um, generally, if you just plant plants that are accustomed to the type of soil that this person has, um, they're going to thrive. Um, if you're manipulating the soil, in my view, you are probably looking at planting plants that wouldn't normally be there. And so you're going to have to take more care of them throughout their lifespan. Um, so you can go about it both ways. Neil? Uh, I'm a lazy gardener, and I'm not going to spend the time or the money to mm -hmm. pick my soil. So I'm going to pick the plants that I know are going to live in it. So like, for instance, if it's a heavy clay soil, and the one example, exception to that is if the soil is compacted. So if you have a compacted heavy soil, you need to break up that compaction or you just won't get anything. And I know where you live in the Southwest, you have caliche and really significant issues <laughs> with drainage. And that's that's where you get out the dynamite, literally. Okay. Yep. But for most gardeners in prairie. Exactly. I, I have I have pickaxe old roads where we didn't know that when we had to put in plants. Oh my God. And you get in there. Why is there a rock down here? Oh, this was a road. Mm -hmm. Pickaxe. Out comes a pickaxe. Anyway, so but if you just have Whatever soil it is, you have so many choices. If it's a dry, sandy soil, plant plants for dry, sandy soils. There's wonderful, wonderful opportunities uh, with plants that grow in those conditions. And there's a lot of plants that will grow in clay. As long as that clay isn't compacted, there's fantastic opportunities. Many of the grasses and, and many of the flowers will grow in clay. And you'll be amazed and surprised at how well they do. And those deep prairie roots will break up that clay over many, many years and make it even more productive. Thank you again to uh, Hillary, Doug, and Neil for coming to tonight's webinar. and gracing us with all this wonderful information. And we hope that everyone has a terrific evening.